Welcome to Networking Field Day. The presentation that you are about to watch from Barefoot Networks is being attended by a group of invited networking delegates who represent the community by asking questions, offering opinions, and discussing the technology that you are about to see. If you would like to see more information about this event, please go to our website, techfieldday.com, and check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hi, I'm Chang Kim. Um, my job here is uh, harvesting. I harvest a lot of beautiful ideas, low-hanging fruits out there, you know, that are all made available by this, you know, beautiful um, programmable data plane technologies, and then I realize them uh, by working with my uh, engineering team here. So, as I said, there are quite a few low-hanging fruits, but very juicy fruits here. One of the juicy fruits is this one, network monitoring, analysis, and diagnostics. And I truly believe that these programmable networking technologies, especially data plane technologies, will completely change the way network admins or practitioners manage their networks. And today I'm going to show you maybe a glimpse of that future by giving you a live demo. Okay. So the fundamental question that every network admin has is this one. Network at the end of the day is all about plumbing. You just need to make sure that there is no leak and then there is no clog in your pipe. What does leak mean? It's packet drops. What does clogging mean? It's two congestions or some unexpected latencies that happen inside your network. But you just want to make sure that that kind of problem does not happen to any packet. So you really should be able to monitor every single packet that is delivered within your network. And then if any of those packets experience some problems, you want to know exactly when those kind of problems happen and why, because you need to be able to give the root cause of that so that you can prevent that from rehappening again. Even when these things work well, you also need to know how well it works because that establishes your SLA, right? Today, unfortunately, no network, no switch technologies out there can give you these kind of fundamental uh, or answers to these fundamental questions. And just maybe a little bit of personal story here. Um, I actually worked, before joining Barefoot, I work, actually worked for a large you know, global online service provider company and then built and managed their data center networks you know, for five to six years. This network, each data center has you know, thousands or maybe tens of thousands of racks comprised of thousands of switches. Managing that kind of network without this kind of visibility was a really, really difficult job. So huge kudos to my former colleagues but I really wanted to share this kind of good news with, you know, with them, okay? So when I say that, hey, we, can, we cannot answer any of these questions, uh, what do I mean specifically by those questions? So here's a network. You've probably seen this diagram a few times today um, when there is some flow going on. Uh, at every single packet, you want to answer a few fundamental questions. The first one, for example, which path did my packet take? And this question, although it may look obvious, it's not that obvious to answer this question, especially in today's data center network where you have a large number of equivalent multiple paths. So one connection goes this way, the other connection goes this way. When things don't work, you do probing, ping, TCP route, it takes this path, but your real traffic takes other path. Your debugging is really, really difficult. Another subtle but very important point about this question is that this path can actually be an incomplete or partial path sometimes. What if your network packets are dropped? Then it takes an incomplete path. It starts from a sender, but it's, it terminates somewhere in the network rather than the actual end host. Yet you still want to <coughs> discover that kind of incomplete path for those kind of packets. But fortunately, suppose most packets or all the packets are delivered correctly, then you want to collect the actual path that they have taken at the switch level or input output port level. Second question, which rules did my packet follow? This is precisely because you need to make sure that your control plane and your data plane are in sync, right? So for example, the packet that is delivered here, it was delivered by these and these rules in each of these tables and that the table entries that got matched or used to for these packets are exactly these things. You need to know about those kind of things. The third one, how long did my packet queue at each switch? How long did it wait in, this, uh, in every hop? Ideally, it should be zero, other than propagation latency, which is dictated by the speed of light, right? But, you know, unfortunately, queue buildup happens. So at the last hop switch, for example, 
you know, you could have a huge queuing latency, but I want to draw this kind of full time series to make sure that, oh, this packet was arriving at this particular point where I had some significant queuing latency. The last question I want to answer is, who did my packet share the queue with? The reason is because sometimes this huge queuing latency might not be the problem that I caused. It could be some other problems caused by, you know, the other guys who are not really, you know, abiding by the rules here. For example, I'm using TCP. They're not even using TCP, they're using UDP, or I'm using just one connection, they're using one million connections only to get more bandwidth, right? Okay, so these four fundamental questions are the things that every network admin cares about seriously. And then uh, with Topino, we can now answer all these questions very easily and naturally, and more importantly, to answer these questions, we don't need to pay any additional penalties, such as lower throughput or you know, higher latency. So now let's talk about the how part here. So the goals are well set now. There are many ways of answering these kinds of questions if you have direct visibility and programmability into the data plane level, but there are two high level approaches that we Barefoot is proposing right now and then sort of uh, building to share with uh, the community. The first approach what we call is packet postcards. Essentially, uh, when the switches receive packet, for every single packet, it actually can generate a small digest, which we call postcard, and then this digest characterizes this packet along with its type, you know, arrival time and and uh, port, uh, the 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 uh, five tuple ID and all the switch internal metadata. For example, so let me visualize uh, how postcard works using this simple uh, diagram. So this is the sender end host, receiving end host there, and then the switches in between the network. When the sender sends the packets, uh, the first switch, in, uh, in addition to forwarding this packet, it characterizes or it generates a small number of bytes that characterize this packet or the, the behavior, forwarding behavior that this packet has received. Yes? Is this inserted into the packet itself or is this a separate? In this case, postcard card approach, it's a separate digest. So and the, so yeah. Yeah, but unlike regular mirroring, this information can contain a lot more information than just the original packet. For example, switch internal metadata, arrival time, you know, departure time, queuing latency, all those things. Okay. And then this, uh, this digest can also be coalesced so that your monitoring system can extract more information from the network without bearing too much overhead. Okay. okay? Thank you. So the next hub can also extract this digest, and the final hub can also extract this digest. Then your monitoring system have essentially collected the full history of this packet, and then if you this for every packet, you essentially can reconstruct the entire history of your network. Okay. So this is the postcard approach. Yes. Does that also include if the packet goes through virtual hops, or can you not like a virtual switch, or can you not see that? If it yeah. Yeah, the virtual switch can participate in this mechanism as well. Yeah. Um, test pros and cons. Uh, this, the pros of this approach is that you really can reconstruct the full network history, and the limit is actually your monitoring system's capacity and storage, right? And uh, the original packets are not changed. The downside of this is that you really can end up generating a lot of monitoring traffic, although the data plane technology that we have can you know, suppress this volume significantly by doing intelligent dedupe or coalescing, but still you have to dedicate a lot of computing power. But on the other hand, flip side, you might think, oh, now I'm building this beautiful you know, machine learning technique or big data processing systems in my you know, infrastructure, so what's wrong with getting more data? Some people may actually appreciate this approach. The other approach that we are uh, building and then sharing with the community is what we call in-band network telemetry. You have heard about this a few times today. So essentially, the switches carry these data packets, but these data packets are employed as probe or log packets at the same time. So again, let's use this simple uh, visualization here. So original packet travels the network. The switch actually adds its own internal metadata into the packet and forwards this packet. So that internal metadata can be anything, switch ID, input port, output port ID, time, arriving time, departure time, matched rules, queue occupancy, congestion status, switch, any switch metadata can be added. And then the next up can do the same thing, the last up can do the same thing. When, and then finally, when this packet arrives at the destination, 
either the uh, Endos networking stack or the vSwitch or last up physical switch can undo all the changes that are made to, made to this packet and then revert this packet to the original form and then only collect this metadata information and send it up to the uh, log system. Okay. So this is the INT approach. And I don't mean to go through this code, but this is really the INT implementation in P4. And I just wanted to emphasize the simplicity and brevity of this one. Right? When I had my network, I had my system, my data plane. The only reason why I couldn't get this information is because the data plane didn't expose this. It was there, sitting there. So only by you know, opening up this tiny door, we get huge amount of information. Right? So this is the part where you actually dictate that, hey, I want to collect switch ID and then queuing latency. If you want to collect something else, you can just simply change this portion. Yes. You're using the TCP options field there. Yes. Is that a specific choice? It could be anything. I could create my own tag. I could, um, you know, inject it yeah. as an, a, an extension header or something like that. It's really just an arbitrary choice. That's a great question. So we, we, we can't care less about that. Mm. Because of the programmable you know, nature of our technology, you can choose TCP options, your own layer 4.5 header, or if you happen to use your own network virtualization protocol such as VXLAN or Geneva or NSH already, mm. you can introduce these things as options to those virtualization protocols. Mm -hmm. All right. okay. Now, this example you use there using TCP options, that could live outside of a programmable network then versus what Greg was saying where you mm. have to strip that out before it leaves into the wild because mm -hmm. right? you're wind up with uh, yeah. problems down the line. Is that, yeah. That's right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, if, if you have legacy device that do not understand this, yes, you have to undo the changes. Yeah. But TCP options in particular is useful because no you know, devices in the middle care about TCP options. Yeah. <laughs> Except <Yeah>. firewalls. <laughs> firewalls, yes. <laughs> So that's uh, in-band network telemetry. It has pros and cons as well. It doesn't generate additional packets it, because it uses the regular data packets as probe packets. But uh, the downside is that you, uh, this packet grows in size a little bit every hop. But if you think about it, this is just a generalization of in-cap protocol that a lot of people already use for network virtualization. Instead of doing it only once at the top of rec sender switch, you just do it over time a few times, right? So let's have a live demo here. So the demo environment uh, looks like this. So you have this Tofino switch working at full line rate. And then uh, it already carries 6.2 terabps of snake pattern traffic. But I reserved three ports here so that I can attach this aggressor sender and then the victim sender here. And then they share the same output port and hence the same output queue. And then they will send traffic to their receivers, respectively. Okay, so uh, this victim just generates a low rate um, you know, but continuous flow around 400 megabps, and uh, the other one occasionally sends a very high rate 40 gbps but very bursty on-off traffic pattern. So this doesn't happen all the time, but whenever it happens, you will see something interesting happen. And then to observe that interesting behavior, I enabled the INT technology here. And then specifically, I'm collecting the queue arrival time of every single packet, as well as the queue depths that, single, that packet has observed at the arriving time. Okay? And then, so because this is enabled, all the packets leaving this port will carry this information inside the packets so that I can attach some simple monitor either here or there, and then collect, analyze, and visualize these queue statistics. Okay, so that's the basic setup. What's going to happen is that uh, when the low rate traffic goes through, and then when there's only this low rate traffic or the victim flow, the queue will be empty. I mean, obviously, there is no oversubscription. One input, one output, and this one is even lower than this output band or speed. So queue is entirely empty. But, uh, and then you will be able to detect that very easily and confirm that because every single carry said, oh, my queue, I, I observed zero size the queue. But when this happens, there is oversubscription, right? Two guys trying to use only one, and then this one is already full line rate of output port, and hence the queue will you know, start to build up. And then you will immediately detect that, oh, the queue is full now, okay? Now, when this traffic goes away, the queue will drain, and therefore you will again soon discover that your queue is back to normal state, okay? 
So, so this is, yes. Just a quick question on the, yep. and you had the legacy switch there, is do you guys, you guys are doing like really high line rates. Do you ever see this scaling down? Like, you know, would you not want this in your one gig switches too? And then really, you know, build this entire family of, of visibility and programmability? Is that on the radar at all? That it's not just going to be the big high horsepower, but it might be at the edge as well? Sure. Well, so may, maybe maybe let me take that question. So you know, absolutely. The beauty of this is it's you know it's applicable to everything, and the technology. What we wanted to go do is prove out that hey, there is no trade-off from a performance perspective because the natural you know question that most people have is oh, you can't you can do this slow, but you can't do it fast, or you can do it, but there's some other trade-off, right? So we've gone and proved that. But you could see this technology being applicable across across the yeah, because like you would why would you not want this just at the data center? Why wouldn't you want this everywhere? Exactly. Exactly. Exactly, and so that's where you see P4 applying to you know many different platforms as well, sure. and you could see this technology scaling in many different directions. Okay, so this is the simple UI, the monitor UI, and um, it will show you the real-time queue occupancy. This is the uh, time series, and uh, this is for the past one second, and. Uh, as soon as it, the monitor discovers some flows, it will show the flow ID, source, destination, IP addresses, port numbers, and so on. So let me start the, uh, the victim flow, the green flow first. So you have probably noticed that it discovered the, the onset of this new connection from this source IP address, source port, to this destination and those destination port. This, is, this appears to be just that, but it's actually a running time series, but the queue is just totally empty. So it's just showing you know, zero queue size here, zero byte up to the uh, certain size here. But as you, if you notice this carefully, the time series is actually moving on. Okay. Now let me start the, uh, yeah, the other aggressor flow here. Occasionally, you can observe that this aggressor flow kicks in and then it builds queue significantly. So, the y-axis is somewhere between 0 to 1.6 megabyte. Okay? So whenever this happens, you notice at real time, ah, something is going on. Why is this queue building up and then draining away very quickly? This is what is called microburst. Right? And then uh, I'm actually collecting this information for every, from every single packet, but I cannot actually draw every or like millions of bars here because I don't have enough resolution. So let me just pause this and then zoom in. Yes? Can I just really, really quickly say? Yep. Wow, you can actually see microbursts? Yes. This is like the <laughs> Yes, for the first time in the Thank history. Thank you. Yes. More importantly, you can even <laughs> characterize they these microflows. <laughs> Maybe they don't exist. Oh. <laughs> OK. Now we'll have proof. So I pause this chart to zoom into this particular bar. And then let me show you this. So because I'm collecting this, again, from every single packet, I can actually see that the queue is shooting up very quickly here and then draining gradually. Right. So this, suppose this actually happened, this seems to be, uh, each bar here represents uh, probably about five microsecond or two microseconds, somewhere between there. So you can see that this is lasting definitely less than one millisecond, but probably maybe some hundreds of microseconds. Hundreds of microseconds may sound trivial, but that's actually an RTT in data center. Right? So these kind of packets are waiting for an RTT. And the chance is that some of these packets are actually dropped, which will make your TCP suffer significantly. Right? But suppose you actually wanted to detect this kind of problem by using polling technology from the control plane to the data plane. The fastest you could do, even at the risk of overloading your CPU, is probably once a millisecond. Then. It's very easy for you to miss this kind of microburst, right? let alone characterizing the uprising pattern and the decay pattern. More interesting thing here is that, as you can see, I have actually already uh, break, broke down this composition of these Q details between these two flows. You may think that this is entirely inundated by the aggregate or aggressor flow because aggressor is actually two orders of magnitude larger than the victim. But actually, if you look at the details, I'm just changing the y-axis here to log scale. There are a small number of victim flow packets here, one or two. But the vast majority is this you know, aggressor flow. So by looking at this kind of compression or composition, you can tell that, oh, this green one is likely to be a victim. How can, right? And the, the actual culprit of this Q buildup is this aggressor flow. The reason? Obvious. This guy is taking the lion's share of this Q buildup. 
and hence it has to be the, the culprit. Right? Mm -hmm. So these two things, right? Characterizing this microburst by looking at the per packet sample, or not same sample, so you are actually looking at every single packet's information, and then being able to derive the compositions of this Q buildup, these are, in my opinion, the unprecedented amount of visibility that programmable data plane can enable. And then this will revolutionize the way people manage, monitor, and analyze their networking systems going forward. So that concludes my demo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you may not have even noticed the little comment that he made, which was while all of that was going on, Thanks. there was just 6.1 terabits per second of background traffic going on through that thing that we don't even <laughs> see because it was going on. That was just kind of going on in the, on the background. <laughs> so you've, seen, you've seen a lot of material about what we're doing here and uh, this revolution and, 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 and how it all works. I just wanted to, to, to check in and see whether there are any final questions. We've already got time for one, maybe two questions uh, about how all of this works. I wanted to add one point of clarification that I think maybe just didn't, didn't, didn't come across. And that is, um, you know, maybe wondering if I write a program, how do I know that it's how fast it's going to run on Tofino? If I write a more complicated program that's doing more things, is it suddenly going to slow down the machine? So I can tell you this. If it compiles, it runs at line rate, period. You can't wow. actually run a program on Tofino that will run at less than line rate. Just a little detail we left out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like I add in IPv6 and suddenly... There's no time slicing. There's no variation. There's no shared memory that's architectures. A, if it's you an want right. your packets to go through multiple times, you can just tell it in the program that you do. No. But if it compiles, it will yeah. run at line rate, period. Is that unique to Tofino? It's just a consequence of the feed-forward nature of the machine. Just purely... A, in fact, you can see it. Mm. There, uh, oh, it has way. right. There isn't yeah. any. I think you needed to preface that with just one more thing. Just one. More thing. <laughs> <laughs> any any last questions before we? Yeah. Uh, you guys haven't announced support for network operating systems yet. I assume that's coming down the line. Uh, Correct. But is yeah. that going to affect um, performance in any way, or the capabilities with which, depending on which network operating system gets loaded onto the device? Correct. So we've we've already integrated Tofino with at least seven different switch operating systems. Some of them are open source ones. Um, you'll you'll, you'll uh, see us talk about things like FBOS and Sonic and things like this that we've integrated with. Um, we've also, with customers' own proprietary switch operating systems, we've, we've already integrated with those. One of the things to note is there's a lot of talk today about APIs, the API that you use to talk to the chip, because in, in, in our industry, typically, this has been a lock-in strategy. We don't care what the API is. For us, it's something you program. You want a different API? Use a different API. We don't care. We are supporting and we've published support for SAI. In fact, we maintain SAI.p4 if that's what you want to use. That's fine with us. But for us, the, the whole thing about a fixed API is just a, a, a consequence of fixed function switches. Over time, the API that you use will just match the features that you happen to be using. Yeah, the APIs are pretty shocking. We have yeah. a lot of problems today with the chipsets, the legacy chipsets, yeah. having very poor quality APIs with all sorts of struggles and business struggles as well. Not just technology struggles, but business, you know, so we publish our, yeah, we yeah. publish our APIs. We open source yeah. our APIs. We don't care.